Apparently people watch this, so that's good. I'm glad if they can't come, but they can watch. I watched it last week. There you go. Yeah. The bad people who didn't know that it was also under You're Right. Yeah, yeah. So... So welcome back. Every week is a surprise. God has a plan. I don't. Well, I mean, we have a bit of a plan, but we have to keep flexible. Uh, and today we're looking at chapters 8 to 11. I'm going to just talk to the uh, phone for a moment. Hello, everybody on the phone. Uh, welcome to part 3, chapters 8 to 11, as we were just saying. Now I'll just keep talking to the room, and hopefully you can join in. Um, so... Uh, We'll do what we did. I don't have any extra background this week. So we're just going to, as soon as Ted comes back, uh, pray. I'll read chapters 8 to 11. And then probably spend about 15 minutes giving you some background. Then we can have some, some conversation. Um, the, the last couple of weeks, which was just fine, most of the conversation was in the form of questions and answers, which is great. I'm happy to, to talk in that form. But if, you, if, you, if we want to, we can have more of a conversation as well, especially with a few fewer people here. It's a little easier uh, to have a conversation so that we can, um, we can try to really enter into what, uh, what we're reading. And then um, I will also um, impress all of us a little bit by taking some more time at the end, I hope, than we did the last time uh, for a bit of silent reflection, prayer, and then sharing of um, what we have heard or received <clears throat> either from the, the text of Revelation, the, the book itself, or from my comments, or from your thoughts, or what someone else said even, was perfectly fine. So we'll start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. We praise and thank you, God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, your Son. You are the Lamb who was slain, slain for the salvation of the whole world, and we pray for the gift of your spirit to enlighten our minds and hearts as we hear and read and encounter your word this evening through chapters 8 to 11 of the book of Revelation. May we truly listen carefully to your word, to the promptings in our hearts and to each other, so that we may know what you truly wish to say to us this evening. We praise and thank you for all of the blessings of this life. We ask your intercession and help for all those in need and all of our needs as we gather here this evening. And we pray all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm now going to read chapters 8 to 11. But actually, I, I would prefer to do what we did before, which is uh, ask for some volunteers. Oh, no, we can't ask for volunteers. Right, Mark. <laughs> That last time. Set up yeah, Wade. Thanks, Wade. Yep. Okay, <laughs> chapter eight: the seventh seal and the golden censer. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to mingle with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense rose with the prayers of the saints from the hand of the angel before God. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were, there were peals of thunder, loud noises, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets made ready to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, which fell on the earth. And a third of the earth was burnt up, and a third of the trees were burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, 
and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the fountains of the water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the water because it was made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so, so that a third of their light was darkened. A third of the day was kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew in mid-heaven. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets with the, which the three angels are about to blow. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key of the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green growth, or any tree, but only those of mankind who have not the seal of God upon their foreheads. They were, they were allowed to torture them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death will fly from them. In appearance the locusts were like horses arrayed for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had scales like iron breastplates, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and their power of hurting men for five months lies in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who, who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels were released, who had been held ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year, to kill a third of mankind. The number of the troops of cavalry was twice ten thousand times ten thousand. I heard their number. And this was how I saw the horses in my vision. The riders wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And fire and smoke and sulfur issued from their mouths. By these three plagues a third of mankind was killed. By the fire and smoke and sulfur issuing from their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. Their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot, see, which cannot either see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their immorality or their thefts. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on sea and land lifted up his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives for ever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it, that there should be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God, as announced to his servants the prophets, should be fulfilled. Then the voice which I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll, and he said to me, Take it and eat. It will be bitter in your stomach, to your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. When I, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter, and I was told, 
you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample over the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant my two witnesses power to prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands which stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, thus he is doomed to be killed. They have power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, and to afflict the earth with every plague, as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends from the bottomless pit will make war upon them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is allegorically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord has, was crucified. For three days and a half, men from peoples and tribes and tongues and nations gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents, because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And in sight of their foes, they went up to heaven in a cloud. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there, was a, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were, that you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged. For rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple, and there were flashes of lightning, loud noises, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. That's chapters 8 to 11. So, um, as the last couple of weeks have shown, there's a lot going on. And um, I want to just mention, as I, as I did the last two weeks, I hope, each time, uh, we're not, I'm not trying, and I'm hoping you're not trying to figure it all out, uh, because, because I, I think it's, it's by design that the book of Revelation just gives us so much to, to imagine seeing and hearing, and sometimes even smelling um, or touching, that um, it, it's intended to be kind of overwhelming. That's I think I think that's the intent of the Book of Revelation, and and our response to that I, I would suggest is not to try to figure it all out, but rather to kind of be patient, uh, listen to the words which we just heard, um, listen to some some background which I'll provide shortly, and then in conversation, discussion, and question, start to figure out perhaps not everything but. What are the things that you need to hear from this text today? What is God saying to you through this text today? So I'm hoping the background helps with that. Again, not to figure it all out, but just to, just to listen. And, and it's almost like, do you ever have, a, I had a kaleidoscope when I was a kid. Do you ever see a kaleidoscope go like that and all the colors change? And it's like, you can't really figure it out. Um, but if you try to figure it out, it seems like that. It seems very disjointed and there's so much happening. So my, again, just... With some background, hopefully some of the themes that are here, which refer mostly back to the Old Testament, some of course refer to events that took place, what Jesus mentioned a couple of times, or referred to a couple of times here, that took place in New Testament times, um, will sort of help us enter into this text. So I'm just going to pass this over to, if you don't mind me, to Jerry. It's, just, it's a very simple guide, just mostly just to take notes if you want to, for each, each evening. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. All right, so um, 
So we already had six seals open, and if you remember, the only one who could open the seals was the lamb who was slain, in other words, Jesus. But he's identified as the lamb who was slain because um, the, 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 the seals on that scroll, that scroll represents God's plan, and it cannot unfold until Jesus makes it possible. He only makes it possible by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. That's like the opening of the seals, one after the other. And um, we've already run through the first six se uh, seals being opened, and there was a, there was a um, problem every time. There was some, a kind, some kind of disaster took place every time the seal was opened. And now we're going to have seven trumpets. Now there's going to be another series of disasters that we heard about that go up the seven trumpets, and a little foreshadowing, soon there will be seven bowls. So it's, uh, each time it's actually more intense, with the first set of, of troubles, it was one quarter was the typical number of the one quarter of whatever it was would be destroyed. Now we'll notice this time it's one third. It's a little more intense. And next time it's like everything. Anyway, we'll see when we get to the bowls, um, what's going on. I think the, the breaks in the action are actually very important as well. So the break starts actually chapter 8, verse 1. And uh, the lamb, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal... There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And if you think about this, as a, I think of it, as a very noisy book. There's a lot of noise. Trumpets, earthquakes, which I presume are noisy, thunder, and so on. Uh, this is half an hour of silence. Um, there, there was, um, in, in, the, in the worship of the Temple of Jerusalem, there was a period of silence in the worship, which um, is just part of what they did. So that might have been a reflection of what's going on here. Um, but I just think it's it's almost like a well, it is literally a still point in in all of these all of this actions going on. This just just a pause. The seven angels come before God, and um, they're given seven trumpets. And I want to focus for a bit on verse three. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a gold censer. So, um, those of us who are at Mass in a Catholic church, every now and then, we see what we call a thurible or censer. That's uh, often brass or gold, whatever thing that holds incense. I was at a funeral here on Tuesday. Funerals are often a time when incense is used. Uh, not, not so commonly at every Mass, but at certain special Masses and, and funerals in particular. Of incense, and and uh, I think this is very beautiful that the um, the what incense means is because the smoke rises up. There's also a, you also smell the incense, um, and uh, it's the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. So it's it's prayers rising up to God. I think that's a very beautiful image. I love that image um, of what the incense is. It's the prayers rising up to God. So it's, it's actually a very peaceful, beautiful image. If, you, if I think of incense as I'm familiar with it, it often has a beautiful aroma that's part of the incense. We can smell something here. You know, this is a very tactile book, as much as it's visionary. Things you hear, feel, see, touch, smell. Um, but then, this altar, so there's, there's an altar there. We already heard about this altar in heaven. Um, the, on all the, all the altar, there is... Fire, you could think of coals maybe, not exactly sure, um, that are on the altar, and the angel throws that to earth. So that's a sign of the next set of, of woes or disasters that are about to take place. Um, and again, peals of thunder, loud noises, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. I would like to look for a minute at the Old Testament reference, which this comes back to. I mentioned this before. Exodus chapter 19. Now, if you're comfortable and you like flipping around the Bible, I've got extra Bibles here so I can cheat and leave this one open to this page. And... Come on in, Kathy. Hi. No. I need to um, talk to somebody. Is Father in your priest here yet? I don't, he's, he's moved in. Okay, I don't know if he's available. So yeah, this is your... He's here. Yeah. Maybe I'm okay with you best to talk to Okay. I don't want to say he's... <laughs> yeah. You want to maybe? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Kay, Kay will be able to help. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So Exodus chapter 19. I'm pretty sure it's 19. Near the front. You don't have to flip if you don't like to. That's okay. Flip later on. If you can't find it, you could write it down in, in the little handout. Yep, so uh, verse 16 in particular. So all the people are gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai, the people of Israel, the Jewish people. God is about to descend to be with them. So every time we run into this, we already run into this, this combination. Peals of thunder, a loud noise, a flash of lightning, and an earthquake. It refers to this, this event. On the third day, as morning dawned, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud upon the mountain and a very loud blast of the horn, and all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses led the people out of the camp toward God, and they took their places at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, for the Lord had come down upon it in fire. The smoke rose like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled violently. Kind of the earthquake. Um... The blare of the horn grew louder and louder. As Moses spoke, God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on top of the mountain. And the Lord called upon Moses, called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. We'll pause there. That's that's good enough for now. But you get the picture. Mm-hmm. As I said before, I think last time, this is the most significant uh, coming of God to to people in the Old Testament. This this starts in chapter 19, goes to the end of the book of Exodus, chapter 40. It's, it's, it's their main connection with God. That God appears to them and speaks to them in other times, other places, but this is the most important appearance of God in the Old Testament. So it just keeps coming back here more than once, actually, in the book of Revelation, as we've already seen. And I, I hadn't actually noticed before, but I did notice just now, the, the, the sound of the horn, the kind of trumpet, being blown louder and louder. And so we've got these, these, this trumpet blast, these trumpet blasts going on. Do you need a hand there, Kay? No, I just have to get a bag. Yeah. Okay, that's good. yeah. Um, so, this should also give you a little bit of a clue. Give us It's intended to give us a bit of a clue. Because in the Old Testament, earlier in the book of Exodus, now where they are now, they've already left Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt for many years. Moses led them out in freedom, into freedom by um, leading them through the Red Sea, which God miraculously parted for them. But when they were in Egypt, before they left, probably all familiar, uh, one of the things that, that God did was bring plagues upon the people of Egypt because they would not let the Israelite slaves go out. And actually, the specific thing they asked for is so that they can worship God in the wilderness. So that's what they're going. To, that's what they say to Pharaoh. That's what Moses said to Pharaoh. My people need to. We need to go out and worship God in the wilderness. As I said last time as well, I think remember that this, as I see it, the center of the book of Revelation is really revealing to us the worship of God and the implications it has and how it plays out on earth. Okay, everything is intended. So everything is made for the worship of God. Because of sin, we are not able to connect with God. That is offering the true worship that he deserves, that we, we ought to give him, that we owe him. So in the Old Testament, this scene at the foot of, of the Mount Sinai is the first great act of worship by God's whole people, Israel. There are other acts of worship as well. This is the supreme act of worship in the Old Testament. And of course, the supreme act of worship in the New Testament is Jesus dying on the cross, offering himself to God on the cross. So you think about all this worship going on, the center of everything, and these plagues in the Old Testament, which are warnings to the leader of the Egyptians, Pharaoh, known as the Pharaoh, I think it's a word, just mean, another word that means king, that he must let these people go free because their God, the Lord, their God, has called them out into freedom. And he's not listening. In other words, the plagues are a call to what you could call repentance. Um, and the Pharaoh does not listen until finally, the worst plague of all is when uh, the firstborn are struck down all across Egypt, and then finally lets them go. But then he chases them anyway. We, we get so that that that's really what John is drawing upon here in these visions. They're they're recalling 
the whole of what the Old Testament's about, which is the worship of God, but also a movement from freedom, sorry, from slavery to freedom. And then those who were calling them enslaved, which is what we're dealing with now, the, represented by the Pharaoh and the Egyptians, they're being called to repentance. And they may or may not respond. We, we see different responses, even in these few chapters that we ran into. So, um, the, um, the one that, so I, I'm not going to go into all the plagues in detail. You can ask me about specific things if you want to as we go. But I do want to mention in uh, chapter 8, verse, uh, verse 10, a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. It fell on a third of the rivers and on the fountains of the water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. Many men died of the water because it was made bitter. The falling star represents a fallen angel. Uh, an angel that is a spirit created by God, intended to serve him, who has turned against God, and is now pure evil. So that power of evil comes to earth, and, and a third of the water is now bitter. So that's back in chapter 8 of the book of Revelation. And a look at chapter 9. Um, we are, we are going to, we're going to meet this star falling from heaven to earth in multiple times in the book of Revelation. Uh, so... The fifth angel blew his trumpet, I saw a star from, falling from heaven to earth. It may or may not be the same star before, it doesn't matter, but it is certainly a fallen angel, an evil spirit. He was given the key of the shaft of the bottomless pit. Now the fact that he was given means that it's not his key, but he was given it for a period of time. So think about who, whose keys they are. The keys are God's keys, everything's under God's control. The keys are given to Jesus. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. But he gives the key to this, to this um, let's, call him, let's just call him the devil for now. We'll talk about him more in a moment. What verse are you at? Sorry, chapter 9, verse 1. Verse I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key of the shaft of the bottomless pit. This is the first time we've run into this bottomless pit in the book of Revelation. Um, Another word, I'm just curious about other people's, I'll, I'll repeat them for those listening. What other words are there besides bottomless pit in your translations? Abyss. Abyss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, abyss. So that word, uh, we talked about this a bit last time. Re do you have any other words no. there? Abyss or bottomless pit? Well, yeah. what about hell? Does yours say hell? I'm just guessing. Well, good guess. I was going to say last time we talked about the fact that the English word hell refers to a number of different things that are in the Bible. I'll repeat them. This is one of them, which I didn't talk about last time actually, but it's important. The bottomless pit or abyss. Other words that are used are, in the New Testament, you will often see the word Hades, which is often translated as hell. Hades is an idea that comes from the, I guess you could call them the ancient Greeks. They had the idea before the Christians came upon them. Christians used this idea. The idea is that there's a sort of shadowy existence after we die, which is very dismal and unpleasant. Um, really a horrible way to live, but not exactly what we think of when we think of as hell. Another word used in the New Testament when we see the word hell in English is the word Gehenna, which as I mentioned last time was kind of like a burning dump near the city of Jerusalem with a lot of worms. So when you, when you see references to fire and burning and garbage it's and filth better. and worms. Yeah. That's a, it's an image drawn from something that Jesus actually knew. He'd seen it firsthand. And the third word I want to mention, the fourth word I guess, is the, is the word Sheol, which is the word from the Old Testament. Very similar picture, as I see it, to the Greek word Hades. A kind of shadowy existence after death that is not... Is something you would want to avoid, something very unpleasant. You're separated from God, eternally, I guess. Now, it's true, as some, I think this came up last time, in the Old Testament, as we get towards the end, there's a growing belief in the resurrection of the body. That, that's, that's something you start to understand. God wants it, and God will bring about resurrection. But we have these words that all refer to this, this bottomless pit. In this case, the bottomless pit is more than just the place of the dead, because it's obviously the home of demons. So this first, these first images, and the, the, thing, the thing about these images is these are visions that John has. Um, 
we don't know, we have no idea literally um, what, what this might actually play out as. We don't know for sure. We do know that these are uh, demonic spirits that are sent to earth to torment and torture for a limited period of time. Okay, that's all we know for now. Um, the one thing of, of all the details, which we can talk about more, I'll let you ask me, we can talk, talk about them some more. The thing that I, I think is significant is verse 7. Their faces were like human faces. So there's a close association between the power of evil and human beings. There's a, almost an overlap, if you like, uh, that those powers of evil, the evil spirits, can affect human beings. In some sense, they are also persons. They're they, like they have their own character, if you will. They're, they're like they have their own being. Um, so they're a bit like us in that sense. They have free will, which they've given up. But they had they have they have their own wills and intellects. So they're persons in that sense that human beings have a will and an intellect. Um, more than that, I think we'll leave for now. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 11 identifies the king over the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, um, which means destroyer, roughly speaking. In Greek, Greek, he's called Apollyon, which means something very similar, destroyer or destruction. Um, the other familiar words from the Bible are Satan and devil. Um, and so Satan literally means, which is a word we'll encounter in the book of Revelation, the accuser. That's a very, very good thing to keep in mind. You think about who the devil is and what he's doing. Is He's accusing. And the thing, the power of the devil is this. He's right. We are guilty. Okay? He accuses us of sin. And we're sinners. The, the, the thing that the devil does, though, the twist of the devil is that that, in, that is intended to lead us to despair. Sin by itself cannot separate us from God if we accept his mercy. Okay? Despair is when we do not trust his mercy, that he can be merciful to us. And that's what, the, so the, the, the name Satan identifies that power of the devil to drive us all, we're all sinners, to despair. Okay, He's the accuser. We'll, we'll, meet the, we'll run to this accuser and, and, uh, as well. And the, the other... Is not the devil. Well, li likely is. Likely is another name for this, because he's, he's referred to as the king. So, I, I would say it would be worthwhile just to, just to... We don't know for sure. The, the book of Revelation doesn't tell us for sure. Probably the same, another name for the same. Like, he's a destroyer. So, these are just ways of describing him. He's a destroyer. He's an accuser. That's Satan. And the other one is diabolos, which is the, the original word for devil, and it means the one who scatters. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit unifies. What does the devil do? The devil scatters. Another way of saying that is divides. So division is a sign of the power of evil. Division is a sign of the power of the devil. The devil wants us to divide us. Um, and again, everything the devil does, the, when the devil is called, uh, Jesus calls him the father of lies. I'm not sure of the reference now. The father of lies, another name for him. Mm -hmm. The thing about lies is they're most effective when they are partially true. And the, and the devil cannot create anything. Can, the devil can't come up with anything new. But w the only thing he can do is he can take what God, what God has created, including truth. God, is, God, Jesus says, I am the truth. And he can twist it for us. We're, we're susceptible to that, right? So when you think about this destruction, think of accusation, including self-accusation, but accusation by others, those are, those are the powers of the devil, and the power to divide, all these things. <coughs> what I think we're seeing playing out in these plagues is the, this is John's vision of what happens when really, in the first place, through our doing, through our turning away from God, humanity turning away from God, the power of evil is unleashed on the world. This is He's almost replaying all of history, past, present, and future, in going through all these plagues. Everything he's describing refers to this intensification of the consequences of sin and evil in the world. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so chapter 9, verse 12, first woes passed, behold, two woes are still to come. Um, then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and there's... Um, there are four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. 
Um, and they are, they are releasing, and again, these are demonic troops. I think it comes to like 10,000 times 10,000. So it's, I think it's 200 million is the number. The number doesn't exactly matter, but a whole lot, 200 million of these demonic troops, which this time are horses with riders, um, and they have the power to destroy by fire, smoke, and sulfur. Um, so th this just the power of evil is just being unleashed. The most important verse there at the end is actually verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot either see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of the murder, sorceries, immorality, or thefts. So, it, I mean, the, 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 the purpose of the plagues is to call to repentance. But as in the Old Testament, Pharaoh did not give up the people into freedom until all the plagues were done. And the last one was the most terrible. So also here, they do not repent at that point. And, the, and the, the most crucial thing, which is the opposite of worship, which is the center of the book, is the flip side of worship is idolatry, the worship of false gods. The worship of anything or anyone other than God. Is well, that question on the end of uh, chapter 7, like, you know, the questions under the book of Why might God unleash it's, I think it's when people start practicing idolatry. Like when, when the people um, adore something else other than God. Sure, and yeah. That's why he sent all this uh, yeah. calamities and... Mm -hmm. But he, he, what he's trying to do is bring about repentance, right? The, the, yeah. the, that's, that's, the point of, that's the point about verse 20, is that the purpose of all of these sufferings is to, is to call people to repentance. And when you think about this, this is one of the, one of the things that I think is, is worth remembering about the book of Revelation. It, he's speaking about the future, but he's also speaking about the past and the present. Look around at the world right now. You can see these things happening. Look, look around at the time of John. 2,000 years ago, the time of Jesus, the time of John. These things are happening. Look at the Old Testament. These things are happening. They're, go they're going to happen in the future. As long as we're around, these kinds of things are going to happen. That doesn't mean it's all random. It just means that we're seeing, which the book of Revelation talks about, this intensification of the power of sin and evil. But the purpose of why does God want these, these plagues to be more and more intense is to call us to repentance. Okay, so... There's a purpose to it, and we'll see how that, that plays out as we go. So I'm looking at chapter 10 for a couple of minutes, and then I'll wrap up my comments. Um, we almost have in chapter 10, apparently there were a lot of flies here this afternoon. I was talking to Sam, who was in this room. It's a spider. A bunch of, this that a was a spider, spider. okay. There you go. It's not the fly. So, <laughs> Some people are. Yeah. Just don't have to worry about it anymore. That's good. So this is almost like another call to John here in chapter 10. There's this mighty angel um, with a little scroll. This is a, a, an open scroll um, this time. So that means it, it's unfolding. It's going to be what he wants John to, to prophesy with. He wants him to prophesy. Very much like what, what is done with Ezekiel, uh, Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, He's given a scroll to eat in the same way. So this is something that John is reliving Ezekiel's call in a sense. Um, and there's, uh, again, all these sounds, which you remember, remember from Exodus chapter 19, uh, the sound like the seven thunders uh, sounded. Um, and then the angel he sees, uh, swores, uh, uh, verse 6, swore by him who lives forever and ever, that is God, who created heaven and what is in it. And you remember... Let's not take that word created too lightly. It's one of the most important words here. It means everything is made by God and everything except God is a creature. There's one and only one creator, one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Um, that there should be no more delay. And the reason for the no more delay here in verse, uh, verse 6 is there is an urgency to God's desire to destroy evil and to call people back to repentance. Right? It needs to happen without delay. 
Um, and then uh, verse, uh, sorry, and verse 7. In the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God, as he announced to his servants and prophets, should be fulfilled. And I do want to actually find you a New Testament rest, referenced to the word mystery. That phrase, the mystery of God, is really, really important. And I, I'm going to look up for you. Um, Ephesians chapter 1. I mentioned this before, but I couldn't find the, the, the verses. It's in, I did find them this time. They're in uh, chapter 1. The letter to the Ephesians, it's in the New Testament, one of Paul's letters. Verses 9 and 10. If you want to look there, you can. You don't have to. You can just make a note. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And you can look it up later if you want to. It's just about what the word mystery means. Because it's a mysterious word. And sometimes people try to figure out what it means. Well, this is actually, I think, a beautiful explanation of the word mystery and what it means in the Bible. Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10. God has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ. So what's the mystery of his will? It is the purpose he set forth in Christ. And then verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time. So what is God? What is the mystery of God? It is um, his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, that means when everything is fulfilled, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. So that's what the word mystery refers to. And I really think the book of Revelation will illustrate that in more detail than in those couple of verses. So God has a plan that is unfolding, that's going to be fulfilled. The plan that is only brought about because of Christ, that is because of His death on the cross and His resurrection. And what's the purpose of the plan? It is to unite all things in Him things in heaven, and things on earth. And you see how that's the opposite of the word devil, diabolos, which is the one who divides and scatters. God's plan is to unite everything in himself. Okay? So that's the, that's the uh, mystery of uh, chapter 10, verse 7. Um, and then chapter 10 goes on. Once again, John is to prophesy. So he's got to eat the scroll like the prophet Ezekiel did. And the scroll... Uh, verse 9 says, will be, will be bitter in your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. So the, the work of the, 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 the pronouncement of the prophet is, you could say literally, bittersweet. There's a sweetness to it, but it's bitter because he's going to announce, he's going to announce punishment and disaster. He's going to call people to repentance. They tell us the truth that we don't want to hear. Um, and verse 11 summarizes that. You must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Okay, That's John giving his mission again in a new way, roughly speaking, halfway through the book. All right, so I'm not going to go into detail in chapter 11, except to mention these two witnesses. That's what chapter 11 talks about. Um, they represent the whole church. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, last week, I think, the word witness is a very important word throughout the whole of um, the book of Revelation. The word witness means the same thing as relates to the word testimony. A witness is one who gives their testimony. It also means the same thing as one who is killed, a martyr. All three of those words are roughly the speaking the same word. The Greek original would be more like the word martyr, but it means all three things. Witness, one who gives testimony, and one who is killed for giving their testimony, which refers to these two witnesses. So these two witnesses are summarizing the whole history of the church in a very, very few verses. They, they represent the witness of the church and they'll be opposed and killed. That is, when the church witnesses that we are killed, those who those witness to the truth, uh, to the nations, will be killed. Their bodies will lie dead um, in the street, in the city which is uh, called allegorically Sodom or Egypt where the Lord is crucified, also sort of Jerusalem. Basically, the, the power of evil and it's centered on earth in a city. That's the idea. Um, and people gaze on them for three and a half days. But then, um, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 11, a breath of life from God entered them. So all those who die witnessing to the truth, the church as a whole, even if the church as a whole is destroyed, witnessing to, witnessing to the truth that God calls us to witness to, we rise again. They stood up on their feet and a great fear fell on all those, all those who saw them and they're called up into heaven. So it really summarizes the whole life of the church. 
these two witnesses. You can think of them, if you like, um, as representing from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, uh, because they have these two different powers that are given to them. One of the one of the powers to turn water into blood, which is one of the plagues that Moses brought about, and the other is to uh, no rain may fall, which is a, which is a plague that Elijah brought about in his time. Uh, so these two plagues identify them. It's kind of like Moses and Elijah. Another way of representing that would be saying Moses represents what is called the law, the Ten Commandments. Elijah represents the prophets. Uh, so this basically the whole Old Testament kind of summarized or brought into now the life of the church. The, the church takes what the Old Testament had and it's, it's renewed in Christ, which is the witness to God's God and his truth. And, and the church is going to be persecuted. People are going to be killed for mar witnessing to the faith. They're going to be martyred. But the breath of life, God's Holy Spirit, will come into them, will be raised up and taken to heaven. So it kind of summarizes the whole life of the church. And there's just a few verses there. Um, it could represent two actual particular people, but they're not identified in any way that we can tell exactly who they are. I'm almost done. Um, but the thing about this, the verse 14, the second woe is past, behold, the third woe is soon to come. So we have the angel, the, the eagle say, woe, woe, woe. Three woes. But the third woe is not really a woe. It's actually summarized. It almost, you can almost say everything ends there. Once those two have been taken up to heaven, many people re do repent. Uh, and then the seven, there are loud voices in heaven in verse 15 cry out, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of, of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's the triumph of God right there already. In verse 15, right? God, God is one, just there. So the book of Revelation doesn't, doesn't go from A to B to C to D. It, it kind of goes through the same, the same kind of stuff over and over again in different ways. It's, it's just showing us different aspects of the same reality. Um, the elders worship God. And I love verse 19, which is where I'll stop. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. God has triumphed, right? His kingdom is the kingdom of the world is now his kingdom. And the ark of his covenant was seen, that is, the, the place of his presence was seen within his temple, and there were, you're not surprised to hear, lightning, loud noises, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail, because God is manifesting his presence once again. Okay, as always, there's a lot going on. So we'll pause, and I will ask you for questions, comments, and if we like, discussion. And I will, I'll repeat things a bit so those who are listening or watching can, uh, can take it in. Was the ark married? I think so. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 12, we're, we're foreshadowing. So one of the references to Mary that you can pick up is she can be referred to as the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was built uh, at the end of uh, the book of Exodus, sometime after we looked at chapter 19, somewhere between 19 and 40. It's built. And God's presence comes. In chapter 40 of Exodus, God's presence comes into the ark. So God is present with his people. It's, 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 it, we should pause when we say it, when I say that. Because like, okay, here's a box that we built under God's guidance. And now, he's in the box. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, I, sh I should probably read it. it it's it's but, one of the most... Is it weird? Is it not similar to our tabernacle? Oh, well, yeah, okay. So, so... We sometimes underestimate. You can walk into a church and just see a box and just bread in it. Well, what? Anyway, look at. Uh, I'll read out a bit of Exodus chapter forty because I think it's dramatic. This is the end of the book of Exodus. Uh, when Moses had finished the work, that means he built this ark. He built a tent for it. Um, the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the presence of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The presence of the Lord filled the tabernacle, which is roughly speaking the tent around the ark. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it. The presence of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So God is present with his people. But, I mean, we don't know what that's like, but we can say, uh, this comes into the second book of Samuel, that was actually very, very frightening. Frightening for the people. Even in chapter 19 of Exodus, there's there all the way through the last half of Exodus, there are the foot of Mount Sinai from chapter 19 to chapter 40. They're not allowed to go up the mountain, not because God doesn't want them up there, because they will die. You can't just go into God's presence. It's, it's dangerous. 
it's overwhelming is the way, the word I would, uh, awe, it's, it's, it's awe so much, we're so awestruck, we'd be struck dead, we'd be destroyed. And there's, there's an event in, uh, I don't remember the chapter, but second book of Samuel, David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And these two men are walking beside it. It's on an ox cart. It's starting to tip. One of the men touches it and he falls over dead. Because God's presence is, like we should say, because Jesus himself tells us, I call you friends, okay? As a beautiful hymn, I love this hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus, the Protestant hymn. Love that hymn. But we can personalize God in such a way that we can reduce him to just another one of us. And he, he does want to be, he is one of us. He became one of us. He wants us to speak to him as we speak to each other intimately and from the heart and share his heart with us. True. But because he's God, it's absolutely impossible for us to approach him. Except that he's approached, he's come to us. And he's given us the power to be intimate with him, to be close with him. But that's never, we should, that, can't, that can't ever be by reducing the magnitude of who God is. I mean, in other words, just overwhelming, the overwhelming more than what we call reality. Like, this is real, I'm real, you're real, we're all real, this is all real. God is, God's presence is just too much for us to take. Unless he filled us with his spirit, then we have the capacity to receive him. Which is what, remember, when Mary received Jesus, Luke chapter 1, it's only because of the power of the Holy Spirit that she is able to receive God himself in the flesh within her. Otherwise she couldn't. She'd be destroyed. Um, so, anyway. That, yes, so I, the, the sacraments of the church are very mysterious. Actually, I should say this. The word mystery, I'm using the word mysterious again, in Latin will be translated into sacramentum. So the Greek word mystery, which is in the original language, gets translated into the Latin word for sacrament. So the word sacrament refers to the presence through something else of the reality of God. That, that's roughly speaking what it means. Okay? So... That's, that's, and so, so we'll meet next week, we'll meet this woman who could be identified as the Ark of the Covenant. Let's talk more about that next week as you were alluding to. Any other comments or questions? There's so much going on here, so we'll not try to figure it all out. Just like, whatever struck you is important. Can, can you just explain that? This is a linear, but time-wise, Yes. Can, can you just sort of say okay. Um, can I help you with that? Sure, go ahead, Jerry. That'd be good. revelation for me. Yeah. If you think about God... He's infinite. So what we think of as 10,000 years is 5 seconds or 10 seconds. So just think of all the past, we think about history and the future, 10,000 years either side, it's just a moment in time to him. So it's all compressed in one. So there's no time. That, that, so I'll but in the book, that's very helpful, Jerry, because that does explain, that. that's kind of the background of what, but what he does in the book is he's retelling the same events in different ways throughout the book. So, he, he's, when they, like we had these seven seals, and one quarter of everything gets destroyed, with the seven trumpets, one third of everything. The point is not like these things happen, the, then those things happen. It's almost like these things happen, but then we see them happening in a more intense way. And, but it's the same thing's happening again. So it's not like, um, you know, the year 500 this happened, and then the year 1000 that happened, and then the year 1500 that happened, and then the year 2000 that happened. It's almost like, He's taking us through the same events over and over in different ways. Like, again, I think it's striking. Chapter 11, verses 15 to 19 is, that's it. God won. That, that's God's victory right there. But we're going to keep going again with, uh, with more trouble. with retelling the same conflict. When we met the devil, uh, which we did with that fallen star. I'm going back now. Uh, the, known as Wormwood, that's right, that's right. So chapter 8, verse 10, and again chapter 9, the first part of chapter 9, we got this devil, he's got the key, he brings up his, all his demons. We meet him again. You might have heard of the, uh, the dragon, we'll meet the dragon shortly in chapter 12. We got the beast, we have another beast. The same, the same being and the same conflict just being retold again. So it's not chronological like 
first this happened, then that happened, then happened, you know, chapter eight, this happened, then chapter nine. It's like um, the, the trumpets are a sequence that go through the trials and tribulations of the church facing evil and the call to repentance to all people. But then we'll, we'll run into these bowls, these bowls which are even more devastating punishment and suffering, which are the same trials just being retold again in a different way. The same conflict being retold again in a different way, this time between the, the beasts and the dragon, um, instead of can, this sister. Like salvation history, right? Yeah. Is like two separate segments, it's divided by the Christ. Christ. Yes. So the bowls, no, the bowls would be, uh, like, because Christ has to come. Yes. So do not the seals and the trumpets go before the church? So it's, it's God growing his people through multiple, like, each of the, the prophets and the judges. Mm -hmm. like, it's, like, everyone keeps doing rotten things. It keeps going yeah. this back and forth. Then you get Christ. Yes. And then it's interesting on chapter 12, you, you, you get the Ark of the Covenant, which we think is Mary. And that's the break point, because then you start going into the bowls, which the title of your course is End, End of the world. world. So then, is that then what we're really so, talking about? And so it is somewhat linear? I'm going, to, I'm going to repeat your question just because for people listening. So we've got these sequences, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, which we, seven seals we looked at mostly last time, the seven trumpets mostly this time, and we're going to run into these seven bowls. I'm going to say they're not linear only because, but take, we should talk about this for a minute. Okay, so look at chapter 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, that's the seventh trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become past tense, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Right? So I'm, I'm saying that corresponds to, that is, that is the victory of God and of Jesus. Okay? The 24 elders um, worship God. You have begun your power. You've taken your great power. You have begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged. Rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, those who fear name, both great and small, and destroying the destroyers of the earth. So, so, in a sense, this is the end of the this is the end of the world right there already in book eleven, because God because the prophet John that is announces God's victory. God's victory is announced there. But then we we go back over the same ground again in a more intense way. Um, so, what I would say if. Like he already met Jesus in chapter one, right? So, yeah. so if if you want to say, does this correspond? Like, it's possible that the scrolls and the trumpets you're saying might correspond to the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and then because we meet Mary and we have this woman and child in the, in the heavens, that could correspond to the New Testament into the future. And it's been so much negativity that it seems perfect to start with hope. Yeah, that. I, I see what you mean. Yeah, I, I'm 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 less inclined to go that direction, but I, I'm not saying it's wrong. I just think we 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 have we have continued repeated announcements of God's victory, because even at the end of the book of Revelation, which is the end of everything, we don't actually on this earth in John's time or our time, we're not actually there yet. It still lies ahead of us, right? So everything in verse 15 is it lies ahead of us. Verse uh, chapter 11, verse 15. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Has not yet been fully fulfilled, right? We're still waiting for that. It's still that that fulfillment lies ahead of us, I would say. Well, because John, at the period of time when Christ was born, the Old Testament had, had been fulfilled. And sure, led, sure. And the destruction of mankind through the flood and through other things that he wiped out cities. He's promised never to do that, to wipe out man again like right. that. But now we have an issue where man is fallen is so far away. And Revelation is supposed to bring us back. Yeah. Wow. This is where it gets confusing. Is how is he going to do that? How do we get it? Do we get the mark? Do we get this? Do we get that? And those who are faithful will be saved, and those who are not faithful will pass away. Yeah. And we'll we'll see, let's see. That it's worth looking at how the fate of those who do not uh, get saved, if you will, or lift up to heaven, uh, go. Go ahead, Ted. Um, I'm just wondering about this phrase that's been used several times, when God unleashes his wrath. Uh, I'm just using that. That's my phrase, so I'll take responsibility okay. well, for it. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's here, there. here too, right? Yeah, yeah. But, um, 
So I want to make sure I have it right. The, the power of both the good angels and the fallen angels is limited by God's will. So they only mm -hmm. can do what God yes. wills them to do. Mm -hmm. And God can never will evil. Right. Correct? Yep. So it's the, the power of these evil angels is not really God's wrath. It's really God taking away his protection and the evil of the angels being unleashed sure. as they would have all along if God hadn't shielded us from their Yes, their so he allows like that. The key allowed. is given. The, the devil does not have the key to the abyss. He's given the key. He's given permission. But that's why I think it's also worth mem remembering these are like repeated calls to repentance over and over. And there's a failure to repent, but then there is some repentance. Uh, chapter 11, verse 13, that city, which is, remember, the, that city is a center of evil, right? That's where those two witnesses representing the whole church, that's where they were killed and people laughed and they, had, they laughed and they gave each other presents. I thought it was pretty funny. They gave each other presents because they're celebrating that the witness, God's witnesses were destroyed. So they don't have to face their own. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They don't. They don't want. They don't want the the, the, the just or the righteous there in their midst. Who they well, as soon as they see them, they feel accused by them. Right? They feel accused by them. But the the, the remarkable thing to me, verse thirteen, seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, a symbolic number. The rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. That means they repented. Most of the people in that city, in other words, did repent, according to that and. This, so I would say we'd have to be careful that that repentance be taken seriously, not as a prediction, but as representing what God is. God is working for it along your like. I'm just extending what you're saying, Ted. Why does God even allow evil to flourish? It's because it it's a call like in destruction and calamities. It's a call to repentance. I don't know if like it, not everybody is called. Not everybody repents. We've we've already seen that. There's there's a hard heartedness that people don't repent. But in this case, there's a lot of hope in that particular line. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think uh, I'm just wanting to ask the question about mercy. Mm -hmm. Like this is a time of mercy. There's great evil. And yes. Them. Like is 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 that in that that phrase there? Like are you we seeing the mercy? Like is this? Yeah, I th I think we're I think seeing. It is with those people. Yeah. That in the word that came to my mind is the patience, because God that, God's patience. God. And mercy are very closely related. Um, that go, patience means a willingness to try over and over again. Like uh, as you may remember, I think it's from chapter three. I stand at the door and knock. You could think about all of these plagues. Is Jesus is standing at the door and knocking, and to get our attention, sometimes he allows. Because remember, the key is not does not belong to the devil. God allows this to happen because He's trying to get our attention. I mean, another way of thinking about ultimate evil is self sufficiency, self sufficiency, or really the ultimate idol is myself, and I don't need God. And I think that's very easy to fall anyone to fall into, no matter how spiritually. Oh, spiritually strong. That's right. I think for any anyone at all, and that's the sin of pride or presumption. And you, the thing about the sin of presumption is you don't know when you're in it because it's very subtle. You just think you've worked hard enough for him that he owes you, and that's never true because it is, as you were saying, it's very important. It's it's his mercy that's primary. Another word, like the English word patience, is is has its root in the word that also means passion or suffering. Um, so, the, there is also a sense in which, well, of course, Christ suffering on the cross is, is the first and most important suffering. All of the sinner, um, you know, I think Second Corinthians chapter five says he was made to be sin, who was without sin. I've, that verse has stuck with me over the years. He was made to be sin, who was without sin. That's a strong. That have you ever thought about that? Jesus was made to be sin, who was without sin. Where does, where does all this suffering and evil, where does it all go? On Him. And so that the, the physical suffering of the cross, I always think, is 
nothing compared to the spiritual suffering of Christ on the cross. Other people have suffered terribly physical torture, like most of the people of Romans killed. Um, sometimes even worse physical torture, but the actual suffering that he experienced, we cannot even begin to imagine. I remember hearing um, an interview, you may, if you're, I'm, I don't know a lot about Padre Pio. So Padre Pio, and that lady who saw Padre Pio once, anyway, an Italian lady. Um, so Padre Pio lived, I don't know when he died, in the 50s or 60s? 67 or something. So he was an Italian priest, member of the Franciscan, 68. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Um, and uh, this interview I heard with this guy who knew Padre Pio, so he knew that Padre Pio was given as kind of a gift. The, the, well, the stigmata, but also to, to share the sufferings of Christ on the cross. And this friend of his, I can't remember, he's a British guy. I remember the interview, though. It was quite striking. He said, I would like to share that with you. And he said, you don't know what you're asking for. So one day this guy, he was a married man living in England, and one night he wakes up and he's just in incredible torment for about an hour. And then it ends, and he realized that was that one hour of sharing of Christ's suffering on the cross that Padre Pio lived with his whole life. So there's also a sense in which we start with Jesus. His suffering, he's, he is without sin. That's like the verse says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He was made to be with... He was made to be sin, who was without sin. Everybody who is in Christ and his follower, in some way, we can share in Christ's suffering for others. We can take upon ourselves. And I think, personally, when you think about big dramatic things, we're probably looking at the wrong place. I think it's more in little things, little, um, little acts of just like being patient with people or being humble when other people are getting ahead or whatever the case, those little, those little spiritual pokes at my ego, which I think are things that we can actually offer for the sake of sinners, others, other people like us who are also sinners. So there's also something about this suffering. Remember the lamb who was slain is at the center of this whole picture, this whole picture. Um, and uh, that means every, all the suffering that we are hearing about here is focused on the lamb who was slain. He's at the, he is bearing all this suffering within himself. Even as we're seeing people being punished, which they are, and people not repenting, people being destroyed, the suffering really is felt most deeply within him. I, I hope that makes sense. That's, a, that's what mercy is like. I think it's like he's taking on that suffering. I'm just going to ask if other people, just, just, just to give other people a chance, any comments or questions from other people? Anything that comes to your mind? I'm still, I'm, I'm still a little bit um, worried that we, we have a false idea of God yes. by the words that are used. Go ahead. Because yep. when you think of wrath, you yes. know, and we, we can only imagine it in our human experience. Yep. It's like anger. It's like, and I hear it often in, you know, in Catholic circles that. God's wrath is God's growing wrath, yeah. because of abortion, because of evil in the world. And it seems to me like it, it's not really an accurate idea, I, and it doesn't really do justice to God's real nature, which is God is love. Mm -hmm. So God, if he allows us to suffer, is only with, with the intention that he brings us back, that he frees us from mm -hmm. the evil that we've fallen into by letting ourselves go yeah. the wrong way by our original sin, by the devil's uh, accompaniment that we've gotten off track. And so, you know, and I, I see that in my own life, you know, that every, every misfortune, even the little ones, and I think it's mostly in the little ones, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm are opportunities to humble myself and to allow God's grace and mercy to be part of my life and to bring me back. So, I mean, these are, these are sort of really extraordinary, um, exceptional pictures yes. that are happening you know, on a universal scale, but it happens in our lives, moment yeah. by moment, every day. Chris Alar, um, I don't know if anybody, but he 
does a lot of talks and he's um, marrying uh, church. And he uh, he spoke about wrath, but he called he, he changed the word from wrath to justice. Mm -hmm. And he says God doesn't speak with it's not wrath, it's justice. And and sometimes you have to be disciplined with love to learn like you do your children, so that they learn to be better people and be more true to themselves. And so if we change the word wrath to justice, so God's melting out justice to his people to make them repent, as we talk about a number of times. Mm -hmm. And if we repent and choose that, because we have free will, right. whether it's a temporary repentance, as we see here, and then I, this is where I think we go back on in, in this, we talk, talk about, because people have temporary repentance when they see a very visible sign of anger, mm -hmm. because once you, that's gone and visible, it's easy to fall back into sloth and sin. And then you get a third of the people and a third of the people, and it whittles down. But it's justice is always there. Yeah. And, and the mercy, as she was saying, is always there because you can repent until the day you die and receive Jesus' mercy to go to heaven. So let's yeah. change it from wrath to justice. I see that in a really kind of a simple way, Ted, because I'm sure there must have been a time in your life or many times when you were really angry at one of your kids for doing something. And, like, there probably were consequences for them. You may have felt anger, but really that wasn't your intention when you were disciplining mm -hmm. them, it was to bring them back. Yeah. Yeah, and God disciplines us because He loves us. That's really important to know. I think the other thing that I think this this brings out too is all of these grand pictures of, you know, third of the world and the stars and everything really is a way of, I think God is saying to you, you matter that much to Him. That your you in particular each one of us, little and humble, as insignificant as we are in our eyes, in his eyes, we mean the world. Like, you know that phrase? You mean the world to me? You mean the world to him. I think that's, you can, you can look at all of this as playing out in one person's soul, or one person's life. This whole struggle that's going on um, is, is really, you could say, just, just like, look at me. I'm, this is me. Not just a bunch of people out there. This is me. Like Romans, I think it's chapter 3. All men have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. And that's where, that's where I think this is... You think about this. These are, this is really a letter. Remember, this is going to be read out when John writes it for the seven churches and, and then beyond that to the other Christian communities. And the people are going to say, you know what? He's right. Hopefully, they'll pay attention and say, hey, this is a big deal. This is serious stuff we're dealing with. And not only for themselves, but for the people around them, mostly in a pagan world, non-Christian world, where people are worshipping all kinds of false gods and idols and doing sinful things, but they're also they're, they're sinners too. So he's, he's calling us all to like, look at how God, this may be, how does God see what's going on with us and with our communities? And how he's giving us time. He's patient with us. His justice is real, and he's going to get our attention, but it's up to us to respond to that. Um, I, th I think that his... This is, also a, this is also a letter from a man to the people for whom he's like their spiritual father, their bishop, as you might say today in the Catholic Church, and he wants them to come back to God. And this, why, why, write, why write anyone a letter? It's because you hope that that letter, which is, this we believe, inspired by God, is going to call them back to him, which is why, why we need to pay attention to this letter as well. It's not just for them out there. It is for them out there, but it also starts here. I'm just going to suggest we pause the discussion. It's nine o'clock, and take five minutes in silence. Now, last time, which I, I appreciated, uh, you can take a look at the booklet if you want to. Um, part three, week three, chapters eight to eleven. There are a couple of questions there. Um, you can use the questions if you want to. You can also read through or skim through chapters eight to eleven. I think it would be good if you went back to the chapters we looked at today, 8 to 11. Just like, is there a verse or line or a picture that really stands out to you? Or perhaps something that was said in the, in the, in the discussion that we had as well. So we'll take about five minutes of silence. 
what I'm asking you for with uh, great respect is please don't talk to anyone for five minutes and just stay within yourself if you can, as best you can, and just see what, listen, listen within your heart for what God is saying to you through what we've, uh, what we've encountered in the last few minutes. So I'm going to thank those, uh, all of you for just taking a couple minutes with that. We're going to just share shortly. And we're also going to ask, um, if you wouldn't mind just pressing that button to turn it off, and I'll say goodbye to everyone watching and listening, whoever you may be and wherever you may be.